Every now and then, a remarkable missionary comes along, a person whose love for Christ touches an entire people, a life that leaves behind inspiration and challenge for all who may follow. This is one such story. Mark Buntain, friend of God, friend of Calcutta, is the story of Saint Mark of Calcutta, as some have called him, and his wife Holga, who were called to the poorest city on earth. They arrived in Calcutta in October 1954, expecting to only serve in India for about a year. Well, God changed their plans and turned the one-year service into a fruitful ministry in India still thriving more than half a century later. This compelling, moving look into the life of Mark Buntain reveals a man of deep love and compassion for the city of Calcutta and the destitute men, women, and children who live there. Mother Teresa said of him, God, in his love and tenderness, chose Dr. Mark Buntain to be his instrument to bring hope, joy, and peace in the lives of many, irrespective of race, caste, and creed. His heart was always ready to reach out to the lonely, the sick, and the dying. He was a man who knew the sacredness of his mission and fulfilled God's will to the end. Now, Mark Buntain, friend of God, friend of Calcutta. I need not recount here the good works of Reverend Mark Buntain, for which the city of Calcutta, the land of his adoption, will remain ever grateful. He found Christ in the poor, the jobless, the sick and the hungry. He will surely merit the welcoming words of the Master, I was hungry and you gave me to eat naked and you clothed me, come enter into the kingdom of heaven. Daniel Mark Buntain was born January 26, 1923, in Winnipeg, Canada. His father was a preacher, and like any preacher's home, the Buntain's family life revolved around the church. When we were little, uh, Mark would get uh, a, uh, a chair and put a pillow on it. And sit Fulton and I down in front of him, and he preached to us, and he'd pound that pillow as he was preaching to us. So we all knew that Mark was bound to be a preacher. There was just no question about that. I always felt like Mark was born to do the work that he finally ended up doing. He just seemed to be that way from the very moment I can remember. Very disciplined person from the very beginning. I believe God had his hand on him from the time he was born to do the work that he did. If you were going to describe Mark from his early years, it would be intense. Everything he did, he did with vigor. There was no question that everybody knew God's call was on Mark's life. He, he couldn't get away from that. And Mark was always in there praising God and preaching from the time we were young. I was always the cut up. I was always the hang loose. And I don't think I was ever serious enough for Mark. Mark never felt that I was very spiritual, I don't think. One time I brought a little white mouse in my pocket, and I went through the line 
and where Mark was bagging uh, groceries, and I pulled that mouse out and shoved it in the bag. And I'll tell you, Mark just, he came unglued. He couldn't believe that I would do such a thing. He thought his whole job was in jeopardy at that time. <laughs> Mark entered the ministry. His first pastorate was to a small congregation on the Canadian prairie. After his pastorate, he went on the revival circuit as a full-time evangelist. Oh, he just won so many to the Lord because he was so, uh, people believed him. I came, uh, graduated from Bible school, and he invited me to travel with him. And so I came as the song leader and drove the car and carried the bags. But Mark uh, wanted me to be in the ministry. And uh, so eventually he was, Pre he would preach Sunday night and I'd preach Sunday morning. My ministry was more of pastoral ministry and his was more the evangelist. So he had a real strong uh, evangelistic ministry, very strong evangelistic ministry. Then of course he continued his evangelism after he got married. The very first time I met Mark Fontaine was when he came to hold a youth meeting for my father in Vancouver, Canada. One night after the service he asked me out for Chinese food. So I went with him, and he talked Chinese all the time during the, um, to the waiters. And I said to him, well, how, how do you know Chinese? And he said, well, I, when I was on the Canadian Prairie pastoring, I made friends with the proprietor of the Chinese restaurant in the town, and especially his son. And I was interested in learning Chinese, and then I was more than curious. And uh, he said, I feel maybe someday God will lead me to be a missionary in China. Well, I froze because I was born in Tokyo and I had seen my parents ha go through so much, um, I would say, difficulties there in the early days. So I made up my mind that night that was the last date I would have with Mark Fontaine. But Mark kept phoning me. We had a radio broadcast every Saturday night called the Vesper Hour. So after that campaign, he evangelized in British Columbia. And he would uh, listen to the radio broadcast. And that was an excuse to phone me to say that he had heard me sing on the radio. And he made several trips to Vancouver, but with the excuse he was just passing through for other meetings. And uh, at that time, he would take me out. And little by little, we started contacting each other on the phone. And most of our uh, courtship, I would say, was by telephone calls or by correspondence. Hulda Isabel Monroe and Reverend Mark Buntain were married on November 22, 1944. My first year of marriage was anything but easy. I remember having my 21st birthday in Portland, Oregon. My parents came down to be with us. And when my dad saw where we were living, he just couldn't believe it. We just had bare facilities, one bed and, you know, kitchen facilities. He, he was quite <laughs> upset about it. But I remember thinking that, I wonder if I did the right thing after all. I imagine it was rather difficult for her, but you know, I don't remember her complaining. Um, she grew up in a nice home, had a good job, um, had her own money and all of that kind of thing, and had to leave all that to get out on the road, and it's not easy on the road. But um, she just dug in and did her part and did it well and cheerfully and was a great help me to Mark. We were holding a meeting in Idaho, and there came a tremendous blizzard, and it just swamped us. That night, we went to the uh, church. We had to wade through snow up to our elbows. And Mark was the preacher, and Hulda and I would sing together. And we got there, and there was only uh, the pastor and one person came. And the lights had gone out. And so we lit candles, and we all sang this little light of mine. I'm going to let it shine. That was our e great evangelistic meeting that night. <laughs> Mark was very understanding and we persevered and now I look back and I think that those years which I call boot camp were training areas for what we had to go through in India from his early ministry through his years on the evangelistic trail Mark felt deep in his heart that he would someday be a missionary to the Orient 
But you see, Mark didn't go to India directly. He felt that God wanted him to be in the Orient somewhere. Mark always thought that someday he'd end up in China. In fact, he, we used to laugh at him because he used to want us to stop to eat at Chinese restaurants so he could go back in the kitchen and talk to the Chinese cooks. I thought that maybe Mark would get missions out of his mind once he went to the Orient for those six months. And God gave him some fantastic meetings. It was actually at Tokyo airport on his way home, which was his last meeting, that God spoke to him and said, this is as far as you will go with the Oriental people. Uh, you will go to India. And he went cold all over. Mark, Hulda, and Bonnie were soon on their way to India. We happened to be in Edmonton with his father. When he got the letter asking him to go to India for one year of evangelistic meetings, and he turned to his father, and I thought, well, his father will definitely say, how is it possible for you to take Hulda with a one-year-old baby to travel all through India? I mean, that's out of the question because planes in those days were, you know, just the Dakotas and... Uh, but he didn't. He said, Mark, you know, I've always learned to take every open door. So I said, well, if God brings in the money for us to go, and miraculously, in just a few months, we were on the SS Mauritania. In 1947, along with partition, came India's independence from British rule. In 1954, India was still struggling to establish her own identity as a self-governing nation. There was hope of creating a new India, where all castes, races, and religions would be accepted. Revival Center opened out in 18 Wright Street. That was a Pentecostal movement as well, so we went to the Pentecostal church there in the revival center. Then, after some years, I don't know just ex what length of time exactly, uh, Pastor and Mrs. Bunting came on the scene. Coming up that Hooghly River to Calcutta was a nightmare. I would look out at the porthole and see everything floating in that river. Dead animals, even bodies, and I'd think, oh my God, what are we getting into? People were bathing in it, and I, I, it was a nightmare. And then when we got to Calcutta. And the mountains ship a city lane boat arrived at my birth. When they came down, I was there with Reverend Dan Morocco. And I remember the gentleman that was with Reverend Morocco who met us. To me, they looked like just college students at that time, 40, over 40 years ago. He told Reverend Morocco, my, they've sent a couple of teenagers. Uh, we look so young, I guess. She stepped off the boat, and here were these Indians going to and fro walking around, passes by spitting out this stuff all red on the uh, sidewalk. Say, my goodness, don't say all got TV over here. You see, God told the bunny on the run. Then the custom officer said, Madam, Madam, don't be afraid, there's nothing. There's, there's a beetle nut which the laborers work use to digest the food. I'll never forget it, you know, I walked off the got down the boat, off the boat, and I saw everybody spitting this red substance. And I thought they all had tuberculosis and they were spitting blood. See what they run back. The Buntings began their new challenge in Calcutta. As were their earlier evangelistic campaigns, it all started with a tent. It was a big day under the tent when this young couple who were uh, made uh, out to be some of the leading evangelists in, in the United States were now in the city. He used to play trumpet, and Mrs. Buntain used to provide the music with her piano accordion, with her violin, and um, she used to sing solos, 
as well as duets with her mother. And night after night, they had meetings. Uh, morning times were devoted to Bible studies. And hundreds began to come immediately. He was a mighty preacher at that time. He preached the gospel with, you know, all his energy and love. He said, I look white, but I'm brown inside. I've got the love, huh? I remember as a youngster, I remember the church uh, Christmas being held over here one year and then another year. It was very enthusiastic seeing the Shamianas coming out, stages being built. But the crowd would be good and they would be singing and there would be, you know, your, your hymns. We were having open air services in, in 18 Royd Street. The AG didn't own anything at all. Pastor Bantin, bit by bit, he uh, built up the whole uh, tentage and Chamiana. Reverend Bantin came along to my father in the beginning. He had come with the idea of doing research in this area as to whether he would get support from the local people or not. The people are invited through handbills, through personal contacts, you know. Many responded, and pastor preached, I interpreted. We had a great time. You know, the English one, then Bengali one. Jamun He's saying in those early days, he used to go twice in a week, that is Thursday and Friday. He used to go out with him uh, to the villages like Bongao, Thakunagar, Ashoknagar, and in those Guma. places, Guma, and other places. And he used to go and uh, uh, meet the families, and in the homes of those families, he used to start money sharing the, uh, the, the good news of Christ. He had a vision, said, Oh God, give us this city for God. Lord, what should we do? Lead us so that this great city of joy might be city of Lord Jesus Christ. Pastor had some difficulty with 18 Royd Street. He, had, he didn't own the place, it was just on hire. The owners of the property uh, had wanted it back for some obvious reason that they only knew about. And we moved to a rented hall above a nightclub in downtown. And people used to comment, well, there's heaven above and hell below. Every single night, I remember services. You talk about young time recollection. I used to sit on the front. My grandmother used to play the piano. My mother was on the accordion. But we had what they would call barracudes. They're like big, huge rats and they would come up the drain. And my grandmother used to play the piano with always an umbrella beside her because when they would start to come out, she'd pick up her umbrella and go bang, 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 so the rats would go back down instead of coming out into the service, especially when my father had the altar call because the people would be kneeling right there, you know. And she was trying to keep the rats back, and she'd play with one hand and bang with the other hand to keep the rats away. <laughs> The conflict started between our church and other churches when many of the people, when they found that our church services are more lively than their ch uh, church services, and instead of going to their own church, they started attending our own, own, own church. I think they were threatened about the Assemblies of God starting a church in Calcutta, yes. I think as long as we had the tent meetings, they thought it was a special effort. When the people, you know, concerned, they watched us, they came to our services, and they saw our lives, and they gradually, instead of becoming our enemies, they became friends. 
Pastor Buntain called for an emergency meeting one evening, and he addressed the group, and he said to them, he said, look, gentlemen uh, and people, either you are with me or you're not. And if you're not with me, I'm still going to go ahead and uh, make plans for the building and the purchase of this property. Property of Royal Street was a turning point. Mark, day after day, went to see dear Muhammad Kasim. And uh, no, no, no. I'll sell you the back portion, but not the front. So Mark said, I don't want to build a church in the back portion. I want to have the front where we had the tent meeting. And he told him, he said, no, I told you that I will not sell this piece of land while you are coming and harassing me every time. But he went home, prayed, and again went back to him. Again, he was money refused. Went home, prayed again. The Lord spoke to him. He said, no, this is the place. Went back to him again. And finally, Mark called a night of prayer. And I'm sure God changed his heart. Because when Mark went back, he said, well, I'll tell you what. I will build on the back portion if you will give me a large enough piece that we can make a road at the one side of the property that I can drive my car into the back portion. Pastor had several struggles. On the outward, he never showed it, but uh, he did go through some deep struggles with regards to property matters, co getting government permit permits, etc. A lot of struggles, a lot of difficulties, a lot of opposition from the church, too. With the money he had, he offered my father for half the land, the portion in which the church is still standing over there today. In fact, it was the first church to be built in a hundred years in Calcutta, opened in December 1959. And why we were so excited, some of the executive brethren were come, had come from Springfield for the groundbreaking service. And it, it wasn't in the name of the Assemblies of God as yet. It was registered at 12 noon, and the dedication was scheduled at 3. Immediately after the groundbreaking ceremony, construction got underway. The Royd Street Church was dedicated on Christmas Day, 1959. Nothing is so important in your life and mine as number one, living in the center of the will of God and living under the anointing of the Holy Spirit. Those are the two essential things for every Christian. To know that I'm in the will of God, and number two, his anointing is upon my life. It was a missionary convention, and Mark asked me to speak at the final service of the convention, and he said, now, Jim, at the close of your service, I'm going to take a missionary offering. And I said, but Mark, these people are so poor, I don't know how we would expect to get any money in an offering for missions. And it turned out that, that that service and that missionary offering was the largest missionary offering that I've ever received in my life. People brought bangles and gold and rings and put them on the altar. But after the service was over and the ushers were gathering up the offering, and people were saying goodbye. There was a man sitting off to one side that was waiting to see Mark and myself at the, before he went home. He said, uh, I work in a casket factory. I build caskets. And he said, for my, my pay, the owner of the factory gives me a corner of his factory to put my bed, and he gives me three meals a day and I don't get any money, so I have nothing to give in this missionary offering. But he said, I do have a dog. And he said to Mark, he said, do you think that it's possible that God would take my dog as a missionary offering? And Mark said, well, I, I, you know, he was so taken aback, and I was too. And Mark said, uh, well, yes, God will take anything that we want to give him. And uh, so the man said, well, that's wonderful. He said, I want you to come by tomorrow. I want to give my dog. We parked our, our motor scooter on the street and walked down this very narrow alleyway into an opening where there was a casket factory. They built nothing fancy. They just built boxes of, for, for the dead. 
And in the corner, we saw this cot, and this man was working on one of the caskets. And when he saw us, he came running over to us. And he embraced Mark and embraced me, and then took me over, took Mark and I over to see his dog. And there, tied to that cot, it was just a beautiful dog, huge big shoulders and ears sticking straight up. And I'll never forget if I live to be 100, looking back and watching that dear man take his, the bottom of his uh, kind of the, the sheet that they wear. They have a name for it. I'm not familiar right now with what it is, but it, he wiped the tears from his eyes as he waved goodbye to Mark and I and to the dog. And I began to cry. And Mark, I told Mark what, that he was back there. And of course, Mark began to cry as this man gave us the only thing that he had, which was his dog. And I said to Mark, I said, Mark, I don't know how we can do this. And Mark said, Jim, it's a matter of principle to an Indian. If we don't accept his dog, he will say that we're not, we don't think his gift is worthy enough. It was compassion that drove Mark to present the hopeless with a social gospel. He asked of himself, how can we present them with the gospel if they have nothing to eat? Now, I will never forget getting off that plane in Calcutta in the early 60s and the smells and the people and the cows and the animals. It was a scene that I will never forget. Calcutta was built main, uh, really for about 2 million people. Now there are about 18 million. I couldn't believe where all these people in fact, I kidded about it, that driving there is like a, a big pile of feathers that you just take your hand and hit it, and they and the car goes along the road, and you have all these people, and they're just people, people, people on top of, underneath it. But when you're eating on a regular basis and have a roof over your head and you have clothes on your back, you know, in Calcutta, that's prosperous. Indescribable. But, uh, boy, the grinding poverty of of Calcutta's busties. Uh, nobody in America lives like that. Mark devoted himself to constant conversation with God. Wherever he was, and no matter what he was doing, he was in prayer. Mark was uh, so, uh, what would you say, engulfed with God and the work and the compassion and the needs that I remember one night he came home very late and I was up waiting for him and I say, Mark, where were you? I was so worried. Don't you see the time? And he looked at me and he said, why aren't you in bed sleeping? You know I'm on the king's business. I can recall him waking up at 4.30 in the morning, driving over to the church prayer room getting down on his knees near, the, near a window on his prayer mat and praying in great, great intercession for Calcutta, for people, for their needs. He always used to pray. While he was walking, talking, driving cars, he was constantly in prayer. And uh, I think that is the reason why God has blessed him and his ministry. He'd say, well, let's pray. And I think we were praying over afternoon tea, and then all of a sudden he'd be in this conversation. And I knew enough as I got older that he was just getting his message for the day. <laughs> or, you know, he was like he was tuning into a superpower, and he'd go, okay, Lord, and he'd say, see you later, Bonnie, and he'd be gone. And he'd forget that you were even in the room with him because he was involved, so much involved with God that it didn't matter what you were saying and talking. And it, not that he was ignoring you, but he was so in tune with God, and you just knew to leave it, to let him, because that was him. Oh, the intense desire to, to serve the Lord and pray for hours, and you know, that kind of mentality, just, ooh. I remember picking up Uncle Mark up at the airport, and I remember he prayed from the airport in tongues, you know, <laughs> or just, he just prayed from the airport all the way to the hotel. And, and he would rock, you know. <laughs> He'd pray for, oh, God, Jesus, Jesus, oh, God, get me back to Calcutta. And he just came home from Calcutta. His prayer brought a lot of victory to 
uh, mission. His prayer was, wherever he was, he just kept praying. Uh, in the car, especially when in the car, as he used to get in, he used to tap me on the back and he says, Len, he says, praise God. And he used to start praying. And in the moment, sometimes he says, uh, Len, stop the car. I stop the car, he's praying in the car. He says, we'll pray. And again, he said, let's go. And then there would be times you'd think he was praying that he wasn't aware of what's happening. I, I remember being with him several times where we'd be in the car, he'd be praying away, and, he, and, and you'd, just, you'd just be thinking of something else because Uncle Mark's praying. And he'd go, uh, would you turn at this next uh, road, please? And, and you'd just go, were you alive? Do you know where we are? He, told, he knew everything that was happening around him. Calcutta could exhaust the best of efforts, but it never exhausted the compassion of Mark Buntain. He impacted my life with, with, with the spiritual aspect of him in that I was able to see Christianity, I was able to see God live through a human person and be able to see how much he loved. I think that's the biggest thing about my father that I remember is, is that he loved so much. He, he loved to the extent that that's what affected his life the most. 1978, we had floods in the city. It rained for several days and the entire city was flooded. It was waist deep water. And in that water, he went out he got a boat and took it to one of the areas to bring relief to some of our church families. Now, he could have been in his flat in Middleton Row. I mean, it was raining hard. He had people helping out. He didn't have to come there. But the very fact that he came there, I mean, I, I said, this is great, you know. He has reached out to thousands, thousands of people, not in their spiritual needs only, but in physical needs also, like having the feeding programs, by having the hospital, the schools, the senior citizens. I think he has done a marvelous job in Calcutta. And he had that, he's a man of compassion. He's full of love. And I think only a Christ-filled person can be like, like that. that. He just stops, turns into a lane. It's just somebody that he watched that was lying on a drain. And he calls me out and says, let's pick this guy up. Puts him into the car, as filthy that man was in the drain, puts him in his car, in the same car. And we drive him to the hospital and take care of him. The pastor never carried any money. He was, can't, couldn't be trusted with money. Because if he had money, he would give it all away. I remember many times he would just go up to her and say, uh, Honey, just give me some money from there. So she would ask him, Why? He said, I'm not going to give you. So she would just count and see that he, she gives him more lesser money than what, she, what he would need. So he would not, because he was a compassion man, and uh, he would never think twice to even think there's a 5,000. And if that guy the first time asked him, and he had a need of 5,000, he would just give him the 5,000. So if it's a 5,000 or a 10 rupees, it never stays more than even a half day in his pocket. <laughs> Nobody was of higher importance than anyone else. It didn't matter to him if you were from the rich or from the poor. He dealt with you the same way. Honest, and he treated everyone the same, whether you were a servant or just somebody who was a big shot. Just equal on the same level. Mark was uh, one of the few people that I have ever known in this world that I would truly call a prophet. He was a man of God, and I think his compassion was truly born out of his passion because I don't know if I've ever had the opportunity to be friends with anyone who had so much passion burning in their souls, passion for people that uh, were hopeless. We always had um, people who would clean our floors, you know, it's just part of the way you live in India. It's got nothing to do with affluence. It's an insult to them if you don't. And we had this one sweeper, his name was Ganesh. And I remember when I was real young, he was a young man too, and I remember my father used to always say, Ganesh, you need to give your heart to Jesus. And Ganesh would always go, no sir, no sir. He heard that Ganesh was um, in the hospital, and we didn't have our hospital then, so it was a government hospital, which was pretty poor. And my dad went to see him, and he saw that he was dying, and, and he, he, he just wouldn't accept that. He, he had to have Ganesh saved, and 
he came home, and I, that's when I kind of found out about it, was is that I remember he would got in the cabin, and he was looking for this soup. We used to get uh, WM packages and um, the compressed chicken, and he went in the kitchen, and he was just getting the stock out of this soup. And he went back to the hospital, and that's when I went with him, and he, would, he was spooning it into Ganesh's mouth, because Ganesh was dying. And he kept saying, Ganesh, you, you have to give your heart to Jesus. You have to give your heart to Jesus, Ganesh, you know. And Ganesh was just looking at him and saying, no, sir, no, sir. Finally, Ganesh said, I love you, Jesus. And my father, my father just, he just went crazy. I mean, I remember he just started praising the Lord. And, you know, you have to remember he's amongst all these different people in this hospital. And he just, and Ganesh then started praising the Lord and just saying, hallelujah, Jesus. I love you, Jesus. And my dad, I mean, it was like an old-fashioned service, just the two of them. They were hugging and crying. And Ganesh was dying, and he was just holding him, and he was praying. And Ganesh died. A man of great compassion, great intensity of love. Mark, Mark had, a, had a, a capacity to love that uh, was uh, the, the love that He, uh, he had a depth to him that I think that few people ever quite under get to a uh, A, a bottomless depth that humans rarely ever become that kind of person. Children were at the very center of Mark Buntain's mission to reach out to Calcutta. It was Mrs. Buntain's uh, idea that our education program came into existence because she said to her husband Mark if we are going to make a, an impression on the lives of these children in India then we have to educate them. Education was important to Mark because as people joined the church they had their children in schools run by mission organizations as people came to our church, who really weren't established in other churches, but um, became members of our church, then these other schools felt like we should be responsible for their education. And many of the children in some of the schools at that time were put out of school. We didn't know how to start a school, actually, because these were poor children and we didn't have the money. Vernon Mills was a missionary to China. Eventually, he started a worldwide uh, children's missionary funding program. So we wrote to this gentleman and asked if there would be any sponsorships available for Calcutta for 200 children. And he wrote back and he said, I'm sorry, but I will certainly put your name on the waiting list in the first opportunity that we can get sponsorships, we will do so. Well, we had no sooner got the letter when we got a telegram from him to say that a school in South India had been dropped from the sponsorship organization. And uh, so immediately he sent the applications and we covered the first 200 children with sponsorships. The emphasis is on education and good quality education. Each one of us uh, would like to send our children to the schools where they can really learn well and discipline, good discipline that prevails in these schools. Father Bantain, in all his institutions, was very particular to put in proper discipline. And good staff, good teaching staff was well looked after and were dedicated and committed. Today, we have doctors on our staff who were sponsored children from nursery, 
And it's interesting where we call them by their first name. We now have to call them doctor. Now a little girl fainted in a classroom after we had opened the school. And he asked her when she had had her last meal, and she said she can't remember. He rushed her to a hospital, and when he saw the state of the government hospitals, he came back that night and he said, I'm going to feed these children and medically treat them. One little girl was hungry and he fed her, and one little girl couldn't get in the hospital, and so he said, I'll build a hospital, and he, and he did it, but he didn't do it alone. He saw me and said, would you help me starting a hospital, a free hospital for looking after children? I said, why? What is the reason? There are so many hospitals in Calcutta. He said, no, but there's no place where the children or the adults are given love. They just, they're, they don't get the love that a child should get. And uh, that's how we started. Which was two beds, then eight beds, 16 beds. Then he thought space was less. Let's put up a bigger hospital. He came home one day and he said, you know, there's a large cemetery on Park Street that hasn't been used for a hundred years. I'm going to get it. I said, Mark, you're crazy. The government will never give you a, a cemetery to build on. Oh, yes, he said they will. And he approached the burial board and they said, what are you going to build? He said, I'm going to build a hospital for the poor. My husband owns a company which are experts in foundation and pastor contacted us and uh, if pastor asked for anything we couldn't say no so we started but pastor being pastor he sort of said you have to bring down the price and my husband brought it down a little bit then again he said a little more and would never think that pastor would bargain but he was a good bargain and then the hospital he wanted it fast you know quick 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 he had trouble even in building this hospital here there was all uh, underground water. We ran into water. And it kept gushing up. Because of the Calcutta soil, the water always seeps through. And the deeper you go, the lot of water comes up. It was a swimming pool. As the gravel poured in, the water came up. The pastor wouldn't give in. And he took a little Bible out of his hand and told the gentleman that was doing the construction to put it in a little cement thing put that into that water. He gathered a few of us together. We held hands and prayed. And prayed and prayed. And the water stopped. He ordered the gravel to be put in. And that basement in our hospital is the driest basement in all of that area. They keep the medicines down there. Medical stores are there. Not even two pills stick together. He succeeded in stopping the water altogether. The Assembly of God Hospital and Research Center was dedicated to serve the poor and needy of Calcutta by the governor of West Bengal on March 26, 1977. One of the greatest heartaches that Pastor went through was the having to close down our hospital for one year. We had labor problems in the hospital. And I'll never forget the day, the first day, our la the labor union of our hospital their procession out with their red banners, shouting slogans against the hospital, shouting their demands, etc. He stood on the fire of the hospital, just leaned over and wept because his heart broke. He had built that hospital to care for the poor and needy. That was one of the hardest years of his life. He learned a lesson, you know, we have a labor government and um, a union was formed, and again, I think he felt like he hadn't kept a firm enough hand on the hospital. His main concern was those who could not have the hospital facility, who could not afford to have the hospital facility. It was a strong opposition of the people that Mark had helped in Calcutta and the patients that had been helped in our hospital, and all of these letters to, to government. Why is that hospital closed when they were doing such work? It was marvelous that we won our case and were able to open the hospital. That was a miracle. The hospital was Pastor's baby. He would be here four or five times a day, four or five times during the night, checking on everybody. 
He's a good man. Mark gave himself completely to the cause of reaching Calcutta. He gave everything within him, holding nothing back. It cost him his health, but even that came second to the work. His back problem was one that really added a cross to his life. He, he suffered tremendous amount of pain. And he would never let people know about that pain, except for immediate family. Mark's health broke down. He, he overdid it. Uh, first of all, his back, his first operation. And then he had many operations after that. Hello, beloved congregation. This is Pastor speaking. It doesn't seem possible that it's 22 days that I've had to lie here in this bed. Thank you so much for praying for me. Now, my precious congregation, I beg of you, do not be discouraged because I am here. I love dear Calcutta. Believe me, precious friends, never give up on our city. Never give up. God bless you. Very sincerely and love you again. Your own dear pastor. Amen. For my husband and myself, it was very hard to see him because sometimes he would just break down and cry because it hurt so bad for him. But um, he accepted it. When he was in the hospital, when I was talking to him, he was in a lot of pain because of his spine problem. And uh, I said, Pastor, is it unbearable, the pain? He said, I can bear it up. And he says, because of my pain, I stay up at night. And when I stay up at night, I can talk to my Lord. It gives me the time to talk to him. I'd say, Dad, when you're preaching, don't you feel the pain? And he'd go, no, I don't feel the pain when I'm preaching. It's when I stop preaching that I feel the pain. But he, he couldn't sleep at night because of pain. He ended up having a lot of, many rods put in his back because he started degenerating. But he would cry for healing. And, you know, I never understood why he couldn't receive healing except, you know, knowing about Paul and his infirmities, you know, and we assume it was sight, that um, it went along the same lines, you know. But he never... I think in my human way, I would have said, now look, God, I've done this much for you. Surely there has to be a little bit of reciprocation here on earth, you know, maybe a little comfort. But I never heard my father complain in that way. It was the Indian people, the people of Calcutta, who embraced Mark Buntain as one of their own. It was his integrity and his hard work that the community appreciates. And they have a very, very high name in Calcutta. Everybody respects them. Right from the Christians to the non-Christians, each and every one has a, nothing but a good word for the Assembly of God Church. He had nothing to do with religion. He, every morning he used to feed 5,000 poor people. Now that, they were not Christians, they were people. If you've been to the Nilratan Hospital, it's a hospital, it's a government hospital, and uh, very few Christians you'd get there, right? And I was so touched, you know. And my father told me, he says, Leslie, he says, he is a great man. And I said that day that religion is what? Here was a person, a person of God who's passing by. I mean, he didn't have to go in. My dad was in a bad condition. He didn't go there with any purpose of trying to convert my father or you know, or anything. He just prayed with him, you know. He did have faith in his own God, and that's Jesus Christ. He believed his Christianity as his religion. But even people like us who are not Christians, we are very close to him because he always felt that each one had the right to have his own religion. And therefore, it is, uh, he decides for himself what is good for him. But that doesn't mean that he would not help because the fellow is not a Christian or doesn't believe in the same faith. I think that was remarkable. If Dad had never been to India, I don't think it would be what it is today. After extensive heart surgery and several back operations, Mark's health deteriorated. And on June 3rd, 1989, he suffered a cerebral hemorrhage. We were making a move from Missouri to Salt Lake and I uh, knew nothing about him being ill. And my mother, I, she was coming to the States to help us move. And uh, we had lunch together. 
And he went to lay down, and I sat with him. And he said, Holder, you're getting late. You better go. And I said, oh, my baggage is already gone. I've got plenty of time. And he looked at his watch, and he said, no, no, you better go. And, and I said to him, now, I'll be gone, and uh, please don't overdo. Because I knew he kept late hours when I was gone. He had nobody to supervise his hours. And he laughed, and he said, uh, I'll be good. So I said, I'm going to phone you from Bangkok tonight to see if you're in the house. And he said, OK. But he said, you can't do anything about it. You'll be too far away. And he teased me, you know. So I kissed him, and I left. And I, and I just opened the door to leave, to go down the stairs, and I went back again. And he said, why have you come back? And I said, I don't know. I just wanted to see you one more time before I left. So he laughed, and he, he sat up, and, and he hugged me. And again, he said to me, please go. You're going to be late. And I lingered. I don't know why, but it, I've often thought of it, never dreaming, of course, it would be the last time that I spoke to him. Mrs. Buntain had just left that morning. I think he must have known that he must have been under tremendous pain because he had an hemorrhage. And uh, he could have stopped Halda, but he must have felt that, look, I'll ruin her holiday. And then when he just couldn't bear the pain, I think they moved him to the army hospital. And I had assumed that maybe he re-injured his back or that his heart was giving him trouble. And he said, no, he's, he's very ill. At that point, I emotionally, I remember, just couldn't handle it, and I handed the phone over to my husband. We could not have kept him in our, because that time, and we still don't have a CT scan facility for that. But I remember talking to, to Jim and saying, you know, should I stay here? Should I go to India? You know, I'm just really, it was really a, very, a struggle. And I knew my mother was all the way on, was on her way to Bangkok. When I got news that he had taken this cerebral hemorrhage just 10 minutes after I left, I couldn't believe it. I remember clearly thinking inside of me, this one's going to be a big hurdle to cross for him to continue on. Because if he has any kind of neurological deficits, it's not going to work for him. And inside it was a struggle, because at that time I thought, if he's going to have neurological deficits, I'd rather he go. But then the next day, we heard that he had passed away. I couldn't believe it. I just couldn't believe that he was gone. It really was traumatic. The news was broken to the congregation um, during the morning worship service. And as soon as the announcement was made, there were gasps. And as the congregation moved out, uh, I observed several people just openly weeping. The shock was too much. A great friend of mine, David Grant, called and, and uh, told me of Mark's passing away and said there's a possibility that uh, no one from the states will be able to attend the funeral. Is there any way you could go? We went to the Indian Council and they were so kind because it was a Saturday. They came in special. Someone in, in Reagan's administration uh, who had uh, known Dr. Buntain uh, made contact with the Indian embassies and uh, they had uh, sent out a notice to all embassies in the United States um, anyone applying for a visa to go to the funeral Mark Bentain should be granted one. And we got into Calcutta and from the airport we went directly to the funeral home. And the funeral home there and here, the contrast is unbelievable. I couldn't believe that the same man hours ago I had said goodbye to could be laying there with only his eyes and mouth showing, you know. It, it, it was terrible. I walked into the, into the funeral home, and rats were running across the road, you know. And you had to walk on this two-by-four over the sewer drainage area, and then walk around. And there was this um, uh, where they keep the bodies. And he was in this cooler. It was all rusted, and there were mice playing over in the corner, and there was wood shavings, and they were building a casket there. And I remember them saying, do you want to choose a wood? 
you know, for what you want him in. And I thought to my mind, you know, here is somebody who could have a funeral anywhere in the world, but this is what my dad wanted. He wanted to be buried in India. He saw himself as an Indian. The hearse was this old, old vehicle that must have been 20, 25 years old. You would almost cry just seeing the condition of that, but it speaks of Calcutta. And uh, we started there, and when I got there that morning, there were thousands of people in the streets that wanted to accompany that hearse from the mortuary to the church. And as we went along those streets, there were people out on their balconies of the multi-story buildings above the streets that were calling down uh, and speaking Dr. Buntain's name, some of them in Bengali, some of them I'm sure in Hindi and whatever their various languages were, and expressing their condolences to the crowd below. And I would assume by the time this hearse made it to the church, there, there must have been 10,000 people, maybe more, I have no idea, but a throng of people uh, had followed this hearse just to say that this man somehow or other touched my life. And this was their way of showing respect. And it was an emotional experience, an experience I will never forget. The funeral was something that Calcutta had never, ever seen before. We estimate the crowd at about 20,000 people. Every florist in our shopping mall had sold out of flowers. There must have been about 700 wreaths placed uh, on the coffin. I attended the funeral I, from beginning to end, and uh, he was, uh, uh, because he was a friend of mine, I, I had lost a friend. The great inspiration to me has been to, to walk maybe from my hotel on a Sunday morning and, and to pass all of the hundreds and thousands of people that you pass any hour of the day in Calcutta and, and to sense this oppressive, this oppressive hopelessness and then walk into that sanctuary of that marvelous church and see hope that people have because of Jesus Christ. And truly that's what Mark was all about seeing the transformation of hopelessness into hope because of God's grace and redemptive power. From the first day he stepped into Calcutta, his theme was, I'll take Calcutta for God. You know, he used to always tell me, he said, only eternity counts, Bonnie. Only what's done for eternity. It doesn't matter here. If you do it for eternity, then you've done it right. Well, that's an interesting uh, sidelight to the story. Mark said, I've been praying for a watchdog for our compound. And so we, instead of getting rid of the dog or selling the dog, we, Mark decided that this would be the watchdog in the compound of the missionary station there on Royd Street. So Mark, we got a, K, a um, dog house for the dog, and we brought him food every day, and he became the watchdog. And the interesting thing about that is, although the man didn't know that when he gave us the dog, every time he came to church, he was able to go out and play with his dog in the compound in the yard of the church. Mark told me a couple of years later, he said he has never missed a service. Sunday morning, Sunday night, any service that we have, the man is always there, and he's always there a half hour ahead of time. And as we come to church, he's out there playing with that boxer dog that he had given to God. Thank you.